welcome, Mila. Uh, it's a real honor to have you here at the University of Chicago uh, and at Ceres. Um, Cinema Comunisto is truly an amazing documentary, and we're all thrilled to see your latest tonight. Um, and so I thought that I'd start uh, the questions for you uh, uh, and ask you a little bit about uh, your publics, your audiences. I was interested first and foremost in how you present uh, to the, the latest film to, to American audiences, uh, that is, audiences that may not be so familiar with the, the politics in question uh, that, are, that, that feature in The Other Side of Everything. Um, I'm just going to give that answer a little intro. Uh, when you're making a film of this type, particularly because coming from Serbia and making films that are, let's say, cinematically ambitious, I know I'm never going to complete my financing in Serbia. So from the beginning, I'm making a film for an international audience. And the whole conceiving of the film, its construction and its editing, is always a parallel process in my mind because I'm trying to do something that will be accessible to audiences that don't, have never even necessarily heard of Yugoslavia or of Serbia or know anything of our history, and at the same time to make a film that is not in any way reductive or banal uh, for an audience that has not only is familiar with the story, but has lived the story. So there's always kind of a double test going on in my head. Um, and it sometimes makes the editing incredibly tricky. But just to say that even from their conception and their birth, these films are trying to address two audiences at the same time. Uh, for me, good cinema is cinema that speaks a universal language, so I don't think that there's anything wrong about that approach. I actually think it helps you really zero in on what are the universal themes that you're trying to address mm -hmm. and kind of give that f film this whole kind of additional layer of meaning or of depth, which is kind of the more universal theme. So for Cinema Comunisto, that was really about, if you if you ask yourself what's the universality of that film, it's about how national narratives are constructed via cinema, which is to say, how does the identity of a nation also uh, play out in cinema and is constructed through the viewing of it? Uh, and now to answer specifically your question, for American audiences, I felt that was a really intuitive thing they could grasp because what country better exemplifies the idea of a national dream and a cinema industry that provides the visuals for that dream than America and Hollywood? So I kind of felt, you know, that if if those themes were teased out uh, properly in the film, it would have no problem translating for an American audience. And when I did do a tour of the U.S. with the film, we really did speak about that parallel. People really got it, you know. Um, with uh, the other side of everything, again, I feel like a lot of the work in the editing was trying to, you know, work on, on the universal, universality of some of the themes that I was raising. And they really are ultimately questions of transmission, mm -hmm. generations and heritage, uh, moral heritage. Uh, and then this kind of question that I think each one of us faces as we grow older, which is engagement or disengagement activation and speaking up or closing off and kind of, you know, ignoring what's going on. So all of these questions of how do you take a stand or fail to in a society that is headed downhill um, are definitely um, themes that an American audience today could identify with. That's my feeling. So that that's kind of where the work lies for me when I'm thinking about an audience during the making of a film. There's, there's um in an interview I recently read with you, um, one of the third audiences that seems to emerge in addition to the um, foreign writ large uh, and the domestic Serbian is the domestic newly transnational audience. Is that um, also um, an audience that you think about when you're in the editing room? When very much, mm -hmm. very, very much. And I love how you describe them as a, as a group. You're right, it's a curious audience because it, it was an audience that while I was growing up would have been a domestic audience, but today no longer is. And so it's one that I really care about. I care about their perception. Uh, I care about the fact that I am trying to communicate with them in a language that I grew up in. So I'm still I'm somebody who was brought up to feel Yugoslav. I still do. I still identify Yugoslavia as my homeland. And so when I'm traveling around the former Yugoslavia, I don't feel I'm crossing national borders, culturally or geographically. Um, and I care that my films carry that message. And at the same time, I'm very aware of the fact that for a large percentage of that population, 
uh, they are coming at this film as a Serbian film. Mm -hmm even though I wouldn't, this is not how I identify myself, but this is how they will perceive me. They will perceive me and the film. And so there is, um, there is something that I'm trying to accomplish uh, using these films as an invitation to dialogue, uh, to a dialogue about what was and is our common past, and there's no escaping that. So there are, they are definitely a third audience that I'm very, very considerate of and very, very anxious about as I travel and present the film in the former Yugoslav republics. Mm -hmm. And uh, just just out of out of interest, it's a follow up to that. Um, but I'm wondering how that manifests practically as you're thinking about that audience in in the editing room, or as you're framing a certain shot. Do you are there people you call uh, as to whether or not certain um, elements of history will be recognizable, or um, how do, how do you plan for that? Um, that it in, in this particular case of The Other Side of Everything, it had to do with the archive work. Mm -hmm. uh, it also had to do with certain anecdotes that I felt, or certain historical episodes that we're reliving in the film, that I felt were important to be told. And, and I knew they would have an impact on ex Yugoslav audiences. Uh, to give you a really specific example, the story of um, Hafner, who is a Slovenian politician, mm -hmm who is really kind of where the archive flashback in the other side of everything begins, his moment of warning to Milosevic. I, I knew that this would resonate as a, you know, as, as also a fact of, you know, this kind of use of what was a common history to tell, to tell an intimate story. So there is, there is that, but for me, um, there aren't necessarily people that I call. My closest friend is Croatian, we studied together, and so she's always somewhere in the back of my mind, like, will this be a surprise for her? How would she react to this? But, um, but it, it's not so much that, I mean, there is, there is an awareness when you're telling this kind of story, particularly about the recent Yugoslav past, that other people's perception of that past may be radically different and that they would even disagree sometimes maybe with my characterization of events. But what is essential to me is that they will find my account honest which is not to say that it would represent their truth of what they lived and experienced, but that they will see the honesty behind my attempt to tell my truth. That I, I really care about. In, in Serbian, the word I would use is vero dosto, you know. I'm not entirely sure what would be the English equivalent for that word, but it's just something, I, I hesitate to use, to use the word truth because that's not what it's about for me. But it's really, But it's really something that is honest about the experiences being told. And this is something that I find very, very important because unless they feel the honesty be behind my attempt to tell this story, I feel that they would shut down in their reception of it. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit as well about uh, your technique um, because, uh, you know, my personal reaction to both of these films is that they're beautifully made uh, and, you know, Cinema Comunisto for me is an absolutely fabulous documentary uh, in which you tell uh, a story and history through uh, an industry um, that is dramatically shifted. Uh, and in the latest film, an apartment does a lot of the work to tell a story. Um, what led you to think that apartments and industries um, would prove such potent storytellers in Belgrade, Serbia, and the rest of former Yugoslavia? Oh gosh, that's a beautiful question. Um, I think that my films begin with a space. And I'm just beginning to realize that m what kind of draws me are ruins. Um, and there's something about how a place becomes a space, and particularly the kind of narrativity of ruins, of what is abandoned, what is forgotten, what is memory, um, how does memory form identity, all of these things for me begin with a, a space. And so the inspiration for Cinema Comunista was the first time I walked into Avala film. It was just a feeling, a feeling of all of the energy that's still circula circulating around there. It was this whole... Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, this kind of the idea of a forbidden garden, of, of closed up, of walled off things, of, of abandoned, um, that really spoke to me because I felt if I had an emotion that comes up when I think of Yugoslavia, it is my rage against the erasing of it. So I had a very clear emotion drawing from that space that led me into making that film. In the case of The Other Side of Everything, it is again a space that speaks to me. 
I don't know how my family would react to me calling it a ruin, but it's definitely a haunted house. There is definitely, it is definitely for me a space populated with ghosts, mostly friendly ghosts, but I feel their presence. And, uh, and it's very, very interesting because um, there is an, there's an African tribe that essentially separates the dead into two types of categories of dead. There are the dead which no one living remembers, and then there are the dead which someone still living remembers. And once that the last person who remembers them dies, they transition from kind of being the half dead to the dead. And it, interestingly enough, my mother in our case is a person thanks to whom a lot of the members of our family are still in this half dead category. And when she's no longer there, all of them will move on to the category of the dead. I, this sounds very mystical maybe, but for me, she's the reason all of these ghosts still exist and they're still alive and they're still very present. And I wanted to use that space and the fact that I feel it, it is so populated with history to try and tell a story. So that's where, if, if we were to now dig in like kind of really deeply, that's where the films start for me. Um, and then there, to speak about technique, um, the cinema I'm interested in is uh, one that is visually exciting. So for me, documentary films belong inside cinema houses. They belong on big screens. They should be experienced communally in the dark. Um, and these are the things that are in my mind as I start trying to come up with the visual identity of the film. Um, I have usually inspirations from my films that are drawn from fiction films. So in the case of uh, The Other Side of Everything, it would have been Hitchcock's Rebecca, because it is a film about a presence you never get to see, but that carries the story. It would have been um, The Garden of the Fizzi Contini's, because it uses the story of a family uh, to kind of narrate a tragedy of a, of a country. Um, Bertolucci's I Conformista. So there's always a visual style that I'm aspiring to, in particular on this film and on the one that I'm completing now. I was the um, cameraman as well, so I really got to determine what the visual style of the film would be. Uh, but there is always this, the challenge here is, is how to make the story cinematic. So how do you prove the uh, ways to dramatize the story, to bring it to life? Uh, what are the scenes and elements that you're going to try and construct it with so that it really plays in the rhythm and the, and the grammar of, of, of fiction films? Because for me, to be honest, and to conclude, the, to, to try and answer your story, your question about technique, I don't really see a difference between documentary films and fiction films. For me, all of that is cinema. Where I do see a difference is between documentary films and reportage. Mm -hmm. Because I feel that reportage has an obligation towards documentation, towards truth, that I don't think documentary cinema does at all. Mm -hmm. I just think I'm trying to tell stories using slightly different tools than fiction filmmakers, which is to say I'm working with real people, not actors. Everything else in my process is fiction cinema. I mean, I think, I think that's one of the things that really comes through actually in Cinema Comunista, where the bleed between fiction and, and reality is, is constantly loose and shifting mm. uh, in interesting ways. Uh, another question that I had about technique, um, which maybe goes to the point about um, that you were making, which I th think is really um, super important and very thought provoking with regard to documentary film is the presence of the dead and the presence of various forms of inanimate objects. So I, my question for you is, what are your strategies? Um, and this is illustrated, I think, nicely in the other side of everything with, with your mother. What are your strategies of using, getting the inanimate objects to take on a life, mm -hmm. um, to interact with your living subjects? Um, I'm thinking of particular scenes in which you, you have from the mid-90s, Otpor pins. Um, you have uh, a series of legal documents from the kingdom of uh, Croat Slovenes and Serbs. Um, how, how, do you, how do you think about that? How do you plan those shots? <clears throat> um, first of all, I, it might have to do with my own personal history, but for me, the, the dead and the past is not something distant or far away. Um, my great -grand my grandfather on my father's side was born in the 19th century. And so I don't know how to explain this, but as a child, I touched 
I, I touch the skin of, of the 19th century. I know how the 19th century smells because I was sitting next. To, so for me, it's not at all a distant thing. It's something that's tangible because I felt it. And, and so I don't, maybe that's why it's such a living thing for me. Um, and I, I think about this a lot because of the fact that I grew up in this house where you know, my, the nail scissors I used used to belong to my great aunt uh, and, and, and date from a time when she was probably at boarding school in, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the letter opener that I use, you know, would have been my uncle's when he was in Oxford in the 30s. And, and so every object that I touch is something that has a story and a past. And it happens to me often when I'm at my friends' houses um, that I look around and I play this game in my mind where I'm, I try to think about what is the oldest object they would have touched in that particular day? And the objects never go back more than 20, 30 years. Like if you think about, if you think about your day today, what is the oldest thing you touched? And it won't be more than 20 or 30 years old. And I think that's a real shame because we live in a society because of this built-in redundancy, because of you know, the kind of way consumer society is constructed, we're not surrounded by objects that are old and that have stories to tell. In my house, that's the opposite. We kind of never seem to throw anything away, and so it's all there, and it's all it's all being used. Um, and the way, what really brought me into awareness of how much storytelling power there is to that, is the fact that a few years back I was in Istanbul and I visited a museum called the Museum of Innocence, which is a museum that Orhan Pamuk created after he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And what he did in that museum is kind of extraordinary because he took every chapter of his novel and turned it into a little vitrine that's full of objects. So the same story that's told in the chapter of a novel, he manages to retell using a coffee cup, uh, a tram ticket, um, you know, a, a used uh, handkerchief, whatever. And for me, just seeing how a, one story can be narrated uh, in a novel and at the same time, just through the assemblage of objects, was mind-blowing, really, really mind-blowing. And it made me realize how much that I thought I would need to introduce into this film verbally, I could introduce simply by a decision to uh, film objects and to activate them. And so there are a lot of scenes in the film where I directed my mother to start something by pulling open a drawer and history falls out in the form of pins or you know her whistle or old money and there are quite a few scenes of that type that I filmed and didn't make it into the film but a lot of the shooting of this film was if we open a cupboard what's going to fall out and I had this whole idea that in that way not only do the objects get activated and their stories somehow get told in the film but the apartment becomes a character because you begin to see it as a kind of repository a museum of Yugoslav history so there were all these considerations when I was filming where I was incredibly mindful about the fact that the objects need to have a texture and, and something incredibly tangible about the way I film them and, and the way I introduce them in this space it's, it's fascinating um uh, and one of the one of the thoughts that I think is uh, one of the thoughts I had as you were speaking, that I think is interesting and you really um, unique and a little mind blowing for an American audience, is just how these commodities objects relate to different moments and state formations uh, that are layered. Right? Uh, you must mentioned Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Kingdom, uh, Socialist Yugoslavia, et cetera, et cetera. So it's 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 something that. Um, I think really comes through in the new film. A related question is, is um, both in Cinema Comunisto and the other side of everything, you make extensive use of archival media that we've taught, touched on a little bit uh, here. Magazines, samples from films, um, recorded music, uh, photographs. Can you talk about your process of selecting this material? Absolutely. Oh, wow, that's my favorite part. I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm an archive junkie. I don't know how else to describe it. but. I could easily spend my entire life digging through archives. And there's a detective element to it. There's an archaeological element to it. All of these things that I find incredibly, incredibly exciting. Where the challenge for me lies is I, I don't know that there are that many films that I find extraordinary in the way they've activated that archive um, and, and kind of made it live and in, in, in exist in, 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 in a new way. I my general issue with archive-based documentaries is that they tend to use archive for illustrative purposes. I feel archive has such an incredible dramatic potential. And so the challenge I've always tried to set myself is to find ways to activate that dramatic potential. In Cinema Comunista, there were a few um, 
solutions, if you like, that I came up with. One was that I was not going to identify, which is what is standard procedure when you're making a documentary using clips from fiction films, is as soon as the clip appears, you will identify it. So there will be the title of the film in the year. And for me, that was the first decision I made was that you would only discover in the end credits what films I had used. And that enabled me to do something that I thought was incredibly important for that film, which is to start mixing fiction and documentary to the point where you're not actually sure whether the clip of what you're watching is fiction or documentary. And I felt that really spoke to the central kind of conceit of the film, which is, is Yugos was Yugoslavia fiction or not? And so, you know, it really kind of spoke to the, the, the central conceit of the film. Um, something else that I kind of discovered as a, as, an, as a technique when I was making Cinema Comunista was I did an incredible amount of archive research that wasn't necessarily just audiovisual archives. And I came across all of these documents um, that, one, I find that there is a kind of, there's an element of, of, of um, verite that arrives the moment you, you touch a document, you know, you, you have a paper in your hand that Tito himself signed. And so that, that, that creates a moment of presence. Um, that I thought was really important. And so my thing was, okay, but how do I introduce that into the space of the film? And one thing, for example, that I would do is I, I found, because the archive research process is parallel to the shooting process. For me, they, they work hand in hand. Very often I'll see something in the archive that will trigger the idea uh, of a way to shoot a scene and vice versa. So um, I had found archive, I was started looking for archive of Tito reading and writing documents because, you know, we're now seeing... It's so funny because you, you see him in an image and he's writing something, but you, you wouldn't know what it is. And then if I can show you a document that he had actually written, something starts happening between the two because now you have insider information into an image to which previously you were simply an external observer. So now you're next to, the, next to him in the moment he's writing. Um, but then I found this beautiful archive, color archive of him reading something outdoors. And then I started thinking, okay... So then I asked the archive if I can take that particular piece of paper outside and film it in the sunlight. And, and I kind of arranged a scene where you have um, a shadow of a tree kind of moving across the paper. And all of a sudden that paper is outdoors, as is he in the archive, and they start communicating. And it was that kind of idea of what can I do to activate what is essentially a dead piece of paper. Um, and very often in Cinema Comunista, what I ultimately ended up doing is I would make copies of these materials, take them to my characters, and ask them to read them out. And so you have two particular moments in Cinema Comunista. One is Reveiko Despodovic is reading a telegram from a film crew. That's something that I had found in an archive and brought to him. It wasn't something that he had in his own archive. Uh, and the second thing is that I asked Bato Jivojinovic to read a transcript. I thought it would, it, again, there are a, new levels of meaning that the archive begins to acquire because it is now the actor who is playing in that film who is reading to us a transcript of their commentary of a scene that he's in. So you get all these meta levels of communication happening. Um, and so he's essentially reading it for us. And I did something similar on the other side of everything because I used uh, some of the archive material that I had found in a scene where I have my mother sitting in front of a TV watching it. This served an additional purpose. Um, I found that very often you trigger something in your protagonists by f putting them in front of the archive. Um, because you you bring them to a moment that is no they're no longer answering about their the past they're reliving it and as they're reliving it they give you a different emotional response to the material and I think it triggers something in the way they retell their stories so for the film that I'm working on now a lot of the process was having my character face the archive and and talk about it and kind of discuss it so there are all these questions about how do you reactivate it how do you bring it into the space of the film how do you dramatize the use of the archive. That was one thing that was incredibly important. And then one final thing that fell into place for me quite late when I was making The Other Side of Everything was I, I was for a long time frustrated with the lack of, I was missing the key for how I was gonna use the archive in that film. The reason for that is that um, I have some ethical opinions about archive use, particularly archive use of the 1990s. Um, there is something for lack of a better word, incredibly seductive about the archive of the Civil War in Yugoslavia. To the extent where too many films, in my mind, cross the line and I think their use of archive could most appropriately be described as archive porn. Mm -hmm. I don't, I know it's a very harsh thing to say, but it, I feel it that strongly. Uh, I feel that there are real ethical considerations that you need to take into account when you decide you're going to show blown up bodies lying on the pavement in Sarajevo 
or streams of refugees leaving Vukovar. I mean, you have to know why you're using that and what story you're trying to tell. You cannot use it for effect. I have a real problem with that. And so when you decide that you're making a film that doesn't leave your house in Belgrade, there you have to make a decision as well, which is I will not be showing archive of the war in Bosnia and in Vukovar because you could not have seen that from a second floor window in Belgrade. So there, there are some decisions that you have to make very early on. And, and it was the same for Cinema Comunisto. I knew the story would stop before the war broke out, that you wouldn't see the war breaking out in the film. So these are all creative restrictions that I impose on myself because it is what I see as my responsibility towards the archive. And so even having decided that very early, very early on, I still ended up assemb gathering some 200 hours of archive material. The reason for that and it was unexpected to me, is that when I decided that the line of research that I'm going to follow with this film is to try and find the archive of the non-acceptance or the resistance to Milosevic in the 90s, it turned out to be an almost impossible task. And the reason for that is that the state television obviously was not covering these events. These events were covered by local television stations, independent media groups, NGOs, which over time lost their funding, were closed, were privatized, or sold, and their archive is no longer accessible. And what you discover when you set out to make a film like that is that the image of resistance to Milosevic in the 90s is disappearing. And I began to see that almost as a secondary obligation that I had. One was to tell the story I wanted to tell. The other one was to gather this material before it disappears. So a lot of that was persuading people to go into their basements, dig out VHS tapes, I would then digitize this material, give them a digitized copy, and in exchange get the right to use it in my film. There was a lot of this going on, and it just became a personal obsession of trying to gather as much as I can. The mind-blowing irony uh, for me is that the most usable footage that I found happens to be in Austria, happens to be in the archives of Austrian state television, because they had the foresight to keep their unedited footage. So the problem of the footage that you can find in Serbia is that it's footage that was edited. So it, and, and at the time, it was the 90s, it was the birth of the music video clip. A lot of it is super uh, montage. And so if you're trying to make a documentary film that has a different rhythm to the rhythm of a music film clip where you want things to last, you're in a real bind. And it so turned out that Austrian television, which had had a permanent correspondent in Belgrade during the 90s, had the, the foresight to preserve the original tapes. But there is something very um, disheartening in the fact that you have to travel to Vienna and pay Austrian television the rights for images of our own protests. So this is a very long answer, but because you touched on the thing that I, for me is kind of where my passion really lies. But once I'd gathered all of this archive, the challenge in the editing of this film was to use the minimum amount of it as possible, which probably sounds counterintuitive when I tell you I spent so much time gathering it. But I knew that this film would fall apart the moment it became a long edit of flashbacks of uh, archive from the 90s. And I knew that, for me, the success of the film coming together as a whole was to find what is the minimal, minimal amount that you can use and still have the story of the past be told as clearly as possible. And, and the key that I was talking about that I finally landed on, and it took a long, long, long time of viewing and thinking, was that I was going to focus on the archival moments when there is a voice of reason that goes unheard. And once I'd hit on the key for use, the kind of the archival use in this film fell into place. It would be Hafner, it would be the parents in parliament, it would be the student who says, I don't want to go to war. It would be the people in 5th of October who are saying, why are you stealing? That's not the country we're trying to build. And so once I'd hit upon the key of using the archive, it was very, very easy to throw everything else out. But until I'd found that, the editing process was a very, very complicated thing to do. It's fascinating. Um, I, the follow-up question was, what are the challenges and, and sort of opportunities of collecting such archival and audiovisual material when new state projects often seek to erase certain aspects of the past? I but can't I mean, believe that I answered the question yeah, you were you going really, to ask. I mean, this was really uh, <laughs> on point there. So um, I'd like to move on. Um, and uh, I should take a We have uh, um, excited crowds coming. Okay. So I'm going to take a quick look. And we should be all right for another 10, 15 minutes or so. Terrific. Um, so what I'd like to do is to take you, I wanted to have stills 
like you do in, in, your, in your own footage, but I was coming back from a place uh, of layered pasts, New Orleans, this morning. So I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that I'm even here. So I'm going to ask you to maybe close your eyes and imagine back in, into, uh, into um, certain scenes that you've, you've um, put together. And I'd like you to just sort of help us understand um, what these scenes are trying to do in, in, in your films, um, uh, for those of us who may have less experience of these, uh, of both the, um, the cinema that you're showing us, but then also the, the history itself. So could you help us understand what was, what was um, historically particular about being a location scout with a binder full of images of landscapes of, of socialist Yugoslavia at Avala Film? Um, why was that a scene that you decided to include in Cinema Comunisto? For me, it was one of the most memorable because you had a, a real set of expertise that was developed um, that maybe isn't valued in quite the same way um, in the present as it, as it once was. Uh, I could be wrong about that. But. You <clears throat> are asking me about things that no one has ever asked me, but they're at the heart of what I was trying to do. That's what I find so fascinating about your questions. I wanted Cinema Comunisto to, I don't even know how to explain this, but I wanted it to bring to you somehow, to cre create in the viewer's mind a feeling for the geography of Yugoslavia. Because Yugoslavia was, you know, a feeling, obviously, uh, and a, a political construct as well, and a film, but it was also a space. And I really was struggling with how to kind of conjure in the viewer's mind this feeling of a geographical space. And my initial solution to that conundrum was, well, I'm going to travel around Yugoslavia, which is why we have you know, a scene that takes place in Bosnia uh, at the destroyed bridge. It was really important to go to the places that are depicted. That's why I went to Pula, and you see the Pula Arena. There was just this feeling of, if I take you around Yugoslavia and I take my characters to certain locations, you know, this kind of feeling of space, this concept of geography will enter the film. Ironically enough, the solution to that conundrum actually lay in Belgrade, and it lay in Veljko Despotovic's apartment, because here was a man whose job had been to map Yugoslavia in a cinematic way, which is to have in his home um, a kind of visual directory of all of the locations that constituted Yugoslavia and the kind of national imagination. You know, what was the lake? What was the mountain? What was the hill? What was the tree? What was the church and the mosque, you know, that conjured the spaces of Yugoslavia? And so when I went to his house and managed to persuade him that when we shoot, it will be in his apartment because he's the only one of the characters who is interviewed in his own home, where the home plays, you know, a scene. Um, it was just for this need to, 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 to use him as our travel guide, as our tour guide of this kind of imagined Yugoslavia that no longer exists. So it was incredibly, incredibly important for me that this kind of, um, you know, feeling of an encyclopedia of the country residing kind of in, in one man's home comes, comes to the fore. It was incredibly important. Ironically enough, and this isn't in the film, but it's in the bonus scenes on the DVD, he had actually allowed his apartment to be a location in the film. And so I filmed that as well. And that was really important to me because that apartment had actually mapped its way into, you know, uh, the kind of geography of Yugoslav cinema as well. So there was something really beautifully layered that was going on in his home. And I, I, I cared about that scene so much that I ended up putting it in the bonus scenes on the, on the DVD. But, um, but it was essential. It was really essential for me because I wanted the geography of that country to find its way into that story. It's just so memorable because he's folding out these, these long panoramas um, and the level of expertise is flooring. Um, uh, I guess I just didn't know much about location scouts in general right. uh, and to see, to see someone operate in a context that isn't quite the same as it once was is really interesting um, sort of expertise that's shifted somehow. And it was uh, also beautiful because he said to me, it happens to me so often, you know, that long, young production designers and location scouts from Croatia will call and say, Veiko, where in Croatia do we have? And he goes, if you climb that hill and then you go a little bit further, you'll find a lake and it's unbelievable and no one's, you know. And it was so wonderful for me that he was sitting in Belgrade and there were young people from Croatia or from Slovenia calling him to ask him where to go in their own countries now to find, you know, a very specific location.
does he get calls from, this is just an aside out of, out of pure personal interest, but does he get calls from elsewhere in Europe as well? That's a really good question. I mean, Eko passed on. Oh, he did. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. they're they're all gone, no. almost. There's only one person left alive from Cinema Comunista. You, I let you guess who that is. But um, he, he, I think, yes, from Germany. I think it's from Germany because for them, Yugoslavia was always a... Um, the, the imagined space of the wild, wild west, because all of the East German, the uh, East Westerns were shot in, in Yugoslavia. So yes, yeah, he was kind of known for being the guy who really knew, he, he understood location as setting, you know, what story is told by that particular space. And, and, and I think that's what made him such an extraordinary production designer, because he really understood the kind of storytelling abilities of settings. Um, this is, this is a, it just happens to be a very different uh, question, uh, the politics of which are, are harder in a way, but a, a, a memorable scene, uh, and there's countless ones that one can choose from uh, in the other side of everything, but one that stuck with me, um, and I think, I imagine anyway, sticks with domestic audiences, just given my, my, my experience uh, in the region, is the moment of the census taking. Yeah. Um, and, and then that's, I think it's also one of the earliest, if not the first scenes that we are, are introduced to your, to your neighbors. Right. Um, and a different way of answering those, those questions. Yeah. Could you talk about uh, that scene, what its inclusion meant to you? Um, that scene was essential. It was essential to me, even when I started thinking about the film, I knew it was essential because everything is there. Everything is there in the sense that this film is trying to break this idea of easily classified identities. So, because it, it is when we, when, when the other, when we start classifying the other in kind of easily boxable ways, you know, he's a Croat, he's a Slovene, um, that's when I think the rift opens and, and wars become possible. And so the idea of this scene was here is an attempt by the state to classify you, so to box your identity. You are Serbian, you are Orthodox, you are this, you are that. And I was trying to bust all of those easy ideas open with one scene, which is to say, earlier on in the film, there's a moment where my mother says, you know, my parents were pro-Yugoslav, but anti-communist. To most people, there's a moment of, how is that even possible, you know? And so there was, so there's already this idea of, I'm going to break down any easy assumptions you have about our identities in general in Yugoslavia. Um, and, and the census is the scene where that becomes fully dramatized. Because, you know, um, when you refuse to answer a question that will be about your faith, your confession, or your, you know, ethnicity or your nationality, it is a refusal to be part of this game where someone will then assume to understand everything about your politics, everything about your convictions, and everything about what you are prepared to fight for by the fact that you've answered thus and thus and thus to a certain number of questions. The beauty for me of that moment is, one, I didn't expect I would ever be able to film it on the other side, so that I would be able to confront two consensus scenes, one with the other, but the kind of unex unexpected gift from life comes in the form of Nada's answers to these questions, so our, our neighbors, because, you know, she says she's Serbian, your first assumption is that you know what her next answer will be, and then she says she's an atheist, and, and you know, and, and then she says she's a proletariat, and so, again, I just thought that everything I wanted to accomplish with this film is achieved by those two moments of people surprising you by the complexity of their identities, and thus, I think, preventing you from reaching any easy conclusions about who they are. And I think, for, m for me, that is where dialogue begins. Um, and it is what I was trying to do with the film. I think this is the penultimate question. <laughs> um, but um, out, of, out of necessity, because I could keep talking about this uh, uh, ad infinitum, so to speak, but, um, this, the, I think we started initially a, in, 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 in our discussion today about your first experiences going to Avala film. Uh, and so I, I wondered if you could walk us once more through the costume shop uh, and how, how your films in general are mixing the, the ostensibly real uh, with, 
with something that might be mythology, fiction, um, and mixing things that are happening in, in the present with, with layers of the past. Uh, it's really funny because um, it's something, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, but I see the past. I feel that, you know, um, even when I'm walking in Belgrade, you walk through Terazia, which is one of the main squares in Belgrade, and you walk by a, a specific lamppost, and I, it's never happened to me that I walked by that lamppost and didn't see the person who was hung there by the Germans in 1941. I see it. And it, again, it, not in any mystical sense, but I, I believe in energy, and I believe energy stays. And um, I don't know if you've ever visited Anne Frank's house in Amsterdam, but I, I would really... <sighs> As I walked through it, and I feel that many people have that experience when they walk through it, everything that girl and her family went through while they were s hiding in those rooms is still there. And I feel it's something, it's almost like osmosis. I think there's no way you can leave that house without having gone through that experience. And so um, f for me, when you know, a lot of people say, oh, your films are about the past. They're really not. F uh, to my mind, they're about the kind of imprints of things that are still there, which is why space is so important to me, because I think that is... How, how spaces earn their narrativity. They simply soak in the energy of everything that's been experienced there. And, and, and to me, one of the greatest documentary filmmakers who really pushed that concept as far as it can go is Claude Lanzmann. You know, when he made Shoah, that's exactly what he did. He took witnesses to the place of witnessing and and all of the energy of what happened there came back. I, I just think that's something incredibly profound that, that that film stands as a landmark to me of, of how that can be done and the kind of process that you need to go through with the people that you're working with in order to achieve it. But it's all there. And so Avala film, walking there, there was, for me, I, I didn't see the ruin of Avala today. I saw everything that Avala had been. The dream that it was encapsulating, the dream of the country that, you know, it was providing images for, it, for me, it was all there. And it made it all the more painful to walk through the costume department and to walk through these cobwebs and, and, and to really feel the disregard and the disinterest of the present for that past. I mean, and, and something I, I take incredibly personally. There's no other way that, I mean, my films come from an incredibly personal place and they come from an incredible need to tell that. I, I, I kind of feel like I don't decide to make a film that that film decides that I, like, the film finds me. I don't know how to describe it, but, um, and so Avala is a particularly painful subject for me because two years after, I spent five years shooting there, many, many times I would put down my camera and uh, pick up things that they were throwing in the junk and put it in the back of my car. So a lot of what I was doing there was trying to preserve. <laughs> And many of the scenes that are, were, are in the film, the walk through the film lab that has no electricity, the walk through the costume department, while we were shooting, I knew with certainty that we were the last people who were ever going to walk through there, and definitely the last images that were ever going to be captured there. And there was a real feeling of, you're making a documentary, but you are documenting. There's a feeling of a double duty that you're serving with, with what you're doing, with your presence there, and you're witnessing. And Two years after I finished the film, Avala film was sold. And I launched a campaign to try and petition the government that if they're going to sell the space, at least they shouldn't sell the catalog of the films into private hands. I had this feeling of Avala produced 49% of all Yugoslav cinema. It was produced with public money, using public funds, of Yugoslav taxpayers, there is no reason on earth to justify the selling of the rights to those films into private hands. I just, I, again, it was incredibly personal for me. And what I did was I edited a series of films which I put online in a form of campaign in the days leading up to the sale, which was the last tour of the city of forgotten films. That's kind of how I called it. And so re-editing this material for the last time knowing that all of this was about to be thrown away and disappear was, uh, was incredibly, incredibly emotional for me. It, it, again, it goes back to 
some kind of emotional bond that I form with spaces that are about to disappear. There is one other kind of untold story in Cinema Comunista, which is the story of the Metropole Hotel, because it appears in the film only as a as an kind of interview scene in the middle, and then at the very, very end, you see a moment where the images of the hotel are being ripped out of the wall. I spent three days filming there, so it, it's one shot, but it, it's, it was three days of filming. I filmed the last three days of the closing of the hotel. And the amount of things that I saw them throwing away as they emptied the basement, um, again, I just began to realize that there's a kind of higher call that I'm feeling when I'm making these films, which is someone has to record what was there, because otherwise we have no past left. And, and one question that I'm always wondering about is, do people in my country really ever ask themselves, where is our past being preserved? Because it isn't. And for some reason that I couldn't really explain to you, I take that incredibly personally. I uh, wanted to, th with the final question, ask you, you're, you're now traveling with ever greater frequency, I would imagine, uh, Zagreb Docks, uh, Amsterdam, Chicago, uh, being subjected to more and more of these interviews. So it's a pretty easy question. Uh, is there any question that you would have liked to have been asked with more frequency about, about your growing filmography um, that you don't regularly get a chance to talk about. And maybe we'll close there. <coughs> You've just asked me every question no one's ever asked me that was at the heart of what I was trying to do. So thank you. Gladly. I mean, I'm a big fan, so, uh, <laughs> so, so it was, it's a real honor. Seriously, uh, thank you. Yeah, much appreciated, much appreciated. Um, and I guess. Thank you.